Um, what else? Oh, we got streets named after Henry, hotels, a magazine. Um, <laughs> all named after him. Um, so, and, and right here on this very stage for uh, 20 years, there were the five by O. Henry uh, plays performed. So, you know, we're, we're, we're in a place again that, that just, oh, oh, I nearly forgot. Even, oh, even William, uh, Will Porter's parents are buried in the First Presbyterian Cemetery uh, right here on the museum property. Um, of course, you know, Corporate Greensboro is very different from today's Greensboro. Uh, it's, it would be nearly unrecognizable to him in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we are a much more diverse city now, um, and we've got we've been struggling, and people have been working very hard to um, make it a more just, a more diverse, uh, and a um, and, and a less segregated city. Uh, but I think that we still love to talk about O'Henry in the time that he represents because he connects us to the bigger world. Uh, he connects Greensboro um, to the wider world through story um, and through narrative. And it gives us a, a, a lens through which to tell our story as a city, uh, but also to reflect back on those stories that he tells. Uh, so I am thrilled tonight to be able to, to, to be here and listening to this conversation about those stories about O. Henry. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass um, the mic over to Beth Sheffield from Greensboro Public Library, who was um, a collaborator, co-conspirator in putting this uh, program together along with Scuppernong Books. Um, you all have a wonderful evening, and we will be taking some questions toward the end after the conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, good evening, everyone. Uh, the Greensboro Public Library is very honored to be uh, co-sponsoring this program tonight. And as Glenn said, oh, Henry really spans the world. Um, I remember uh, with a, an international organization I volunteer with uh, called North Carolina Global Leadership, we had a visitor from uh, Kazakhstan here, and uh, Ahmed John Abulev, when he found out that this was the home of the great of Henry, wanted to see everything the museum had to offer. He was so excited. We went to every statue. We stood on the corner of Elm Street and was just because that was how he had learned English was by reading the works of O. Henry. So it's in, in some in some countries it's, you know, instead of reading Dickens, they would read O. Henry to learn English. So he was just 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 excited. And uh, I'm so honored to introduce our two speakers tonight too. Uh, many of you know uh, our moderator and conversationalist tonight, Jim Dotson, um, who is a journalist here in town and uh, is uh, founder of the co-founder of the founding editor of the O. Henry magazine, and O. Henry magazine is celebrating its tenth year here in Greensboro. I think that's really great. And he's known for his best-selling books, Final Rounds, Fateful Travelers, The Do Keepers, Beautiful Madness, The Road to Somewhere. Um, and others, and also has a new book on the great wagon road that he's worked, been working on during these, these COVID times. And, yes. yes. <laughs> and he is in conversation here, you know, for Greensboro. Let's give Ben, you get a big round of applause. I'm so excited to hear a lot of this. Uh, in addition to this wonderful book, that Scuppered on Books is here and has for sale in the lobby, this edited version, which we'll be happy to sign um, of 101 stories of O. Henry. Um, uh, uh, ben Ugoda is the editor and professor of journalism and English at the University of Delaware. He is the author of 12 books, including The B-Side, The Death of Tin Pan Alley, and The Rebirth of the Great American Song. His work has been featured in The New Leader, The New York Times, Newsweek, and Rolling Stone, among other publications. So let's enjoy this uh, fascinating discussion, and thank you both for this. 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, very welcome. Thank you so much, and, and thank you all for coming. I'm I'm, I'm touched and uh, delighted to be the first event here uh, after a long pause. So uh, thanks so much for coming, and very happy to be here. And you took an airplane, and you just like normal life, you could walk the streets and spend a little time in Greensboro, right? You, uh, I, I have been, and, and the weather is yeah, beautiful. Yeah, you, you brought us a relief. How about that? In the last <laughs> few weeks. And at home, my yeah. house nearly flooded, but yeah. escaped yeah. it in, in Philadelphia. Um, so I, I dodged that bullet. And uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to be here. You know, the one thing uh, I, Beth gave a wonderful introduction, wonderful introduction about all the places, and so did Glenn about where you can see traces of Henry and Greensboro. You won't find his body here. You know that, right? And Asheville. So, yeah, yeah. His, because his sweetheart, of the mean, uh, the mean he's, he's to be quite a shrew. I, I'm reliably told by two of his friends. You know, no, no comment on that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> she insisted that he be buried there, uh, which really just is a, put salt in the wound, I think. In fact, he had no other connection to, to Asheville. Well, right? no, just a filial one. And yeah. um, so when the very first conversation we had in a Henry magazine, and I'll tell, I'll tell you why I, I wanted to name the magazine of Henry in the, in the moment. Uh, but the very first conversation, we had a wonderful guy named David Bailey, who was our first senior editor. Here it is, Glass Eye, I can quote the, the first 100 stanzas of, uh, of uh, the Iliad. Uh, we memorized it. I'm not making it up. Great character. We were sitting around our first story with Marie Johnson and, and Jim Slosher, and, uh, and we said, you know, what's the first thing we should write about how unfair it is that o. Henry's not buried here? So we launched a, 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 a citizen <laughs> petition. We got about 500 signatures. If you sign, raise your hand. You were a late reader. Of <laughs> And uh, we sent it off, uh, and we never heard back. Uh, but, but Jim Slosher wrote a really funny, wonderful story about how Henry it's, it's only fair to have him here. Um, so I guess we'd have to we would have to bring his daughter here as well, uh, which is fun because it's a great story. I, I uh, I'll just briefly mention the origins of Henry since it is our tenth anniversary, and you're all invited to a Odin Brewery on I think it's the Thursday after Halloween. We're going to celebrate, and you can come and get free beer and food and, uh, and lots of fun things from Henry. So we hope you'll come out then. Um, you know, when I when I came, I'm a son of this town, and uh, I I grew up, and I think I'm I, I am the the first and last modern winner of the Henry Award that the city gave out for 1921, I believe, to 1970. Which happened to be my year. I, the way I justify this is I won. I was a, I was a junior at Grimsley, and I wrote a, st a short story. Um, I can't say it was based on O. Henry, but my dad had given me uh, O. Henry stories when I was a freshman, and uh, uh, I uh, wrote this story about my grandfather's farm. And I'm, I can't remember the O. Henry ending because I lost the story years ago. It was fifty years ago, but uh, the. Uh, I, I wanted surprised all my friends and everybody at Grimsley who knew me as a baseball player and played a little football and golfer. And they're like, good Lord, you write too. So shocked to all my friends. I, I won the Henry Award that year and they didn't give it again for the next 10 years. So I figured it must have just, there must have been a serious conversation about, you know, this guy wins the Henry Award. We got to stop it after 50 years. So. But it was a great honor and it really did set me on a road of thinking about this guy. Um, and that's not just why I wanted to name the magazine. I knew that this, this, this larger than life character permeates so much of the culture here uh, and was, was and still alive today. So I'd like to ask you how you were introduced to Henry and, and what, why is he so relevant today? Well, um, I was introduced, like I think many, if not most people, through what was then called junior high school, and now it's middle school. Yeah. Somehow they changed that along the way. And um, there was an anthology that we were assigned. And I have to confess, again, like many people, I didn't retain um, most of the stories. Of course, the inevitable gift of the Magi and, and the one that you and I share an enthusiasm for, the cop and the anthem, 
Ransom Red Chief, or Red Chief, Last Leaf, those were probably the only ones in my consciousness. Um, then uh, 50 years passed, and uh, as, as the introduction said, I'm, I'm a nonfiction book writer and have written biographies, uh, a, a biography of Will Rogers and a historical book about the New Yorker magazine. I was looking for a new book project and was thinking I'd like to get back into biographies. Um, and I don't remember how the name O. Henry popped into my mind, but I said, hmm, let me look into him. And um, as we'll get into, he had a fascinating life uh, full of twists and turns and mystery and action and adventure. Uh, so it would seem to have been a good subject, but I didn't take it on for the reason one simple reason was that a guy in 1957 named Gerald Langford wrote a really good biography called Alias O. Henry, uh, which I recommend to you. It's been out of print probably since 1958, but it, it's in libraries. I'm sure it's widely available here. And it's just a, a solid, well-researched, well-written book. And there have actually been a couple since then, not so good. And I just said, I don't want to uh, recreate what this man has already done so well. Um, but in the course of uh, looking into that as a book project, I started reading his stories. And first of all, found out that there's a lot more than four of them, <laughs> a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, they're really good. Many of them are really good in, in ways that are unexpected. I mean, the sentimentality of Gift to the Magi is something that people think about, but um, they were sharp, they were funny, uh, they were uh, evocative of a fascinating period in New York where he lived from 1902 to his death in 1910. And I said, let me put together a new anthology for this series, The Library of America, which is uh, a, a wonderful series of uh, high quality, uh, uniform books of, of major American authors. So they said, okay, and I did it, and here we are. Why is he, why, well, maybe we should talk to, go work our way to the question of why he's more relevant today. Um, I, I, uh, I'm a biographer too. I wrote Ben Hogan's author right. biography, which is 500 pages of a very difficult life in London. And as an investigative journalist in the Deep South for years, one of the things I had learned in my, my own journalism journey was that people's experiences truly do shape their worldview and, and how they live their lives. Hogan is a perfect example of that, especially people that get to a high level of uh, success. Oh, Henry's to me reads like one of his stories. Um, in a leading town here, 20, um, moving to Texas, working on a ranch, uh, you know, moving into Austin, marrying a girl whose mother didn't want him wanted to marry him because she was ill with TV. Um, yeah, so. and, and, you know, <laughs> married her, if I'm remembering the detail from Elias so Henry correctly, <laughs> on the day of her high school graduation, right. yeah. <laughs> he, he, he sort of ran into her in town and said, uh, hey, why don't, why don't we, they've been dating for a while. Um, and by the end of the day, they were married. Um, yeah, un and unlike- Reportedly they met, at the laying of the stone of the Texas State House. I read that years ago, and I was told that was pretty interesting. What a great way to pick up chicks in Texas. <laughs> and, and the First you lay the stone, then. Yeah, 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 we get it. No, we got it. Don't, don't include it. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and then he, uh, I mean, he really strikes me as, what I, you know, journalism was an accidental uh, profession at that time. You had people who, who followed the, the Civil War, who wrote dispatches for, um, you know, newspapers. And, uh, but, but really, there was no discipline of journalism, as you know, than anybody. I mean, there was not a, certainly not a school you didn't go to learn it. And the reporters at the turn of the century even were, tended to be guys who worked in, in the street, were the assistants to the reporters. And they, they were always getting to hearing stuff in the, in the local halls and the smoke-filled rooms. And reporters were a pretty, I would almost compare them to early golf pros. They were not, you know, they were, they were kind of a slightly shady collection of professionals, if you want to mm -hmm. call them professionals. 
And it's interesting to see how many people started who became great journalists who started kind of as a human group. I mean, he, he got, you know, he moves to Austin. He goes to work, I think, for the land company as an agent first, and then he switches to the bank and he starts writing for the, the, uh, the Rolling Stone, these whimsical pieces. He's studying people in the hotel there and he, he finds them very interesting and he starts writing these little personality pieces. And uh, it, well, he he started Rolling Stone. He bought the press right. of another magazine and had this ideas. He, he, and he was, you know, as your description suggests, a, a, a shiftless, rootless right. guy who didn't uh, make a success at anything. And he started out as a pharmacist here in right. Greensboro, like his uncle. Um, but no, nothing seemed to work. And so all of a sudden, he's starting a humor magazine and spending a lot of money on it which probably led to his later problems at the bank. But, uh, you know, where did that come from? He, he was known as a youth here for uh, a good sense of humor and, and doing these uh, drawings, many of which are here in the museum, uh, caricatures and, and wit, but the idea that he would become a writer or humorist, right. Where did he get that? Well, but he was a social observer, and that's where I was going with this. That's what the early reporters did. They caught that. They caught the ear of the politician at the boxing match. You know, and they, that's if you look at a lot of early journalism. When I was working on Sneed, Hogan, Nelson, and Bobby Jones on the current project, and Harry Varden and those guys, this is turn of the century golf, and at the twenties, uh, there's this concept called ballyhoo, and then what it meant was the reporters amped up the stories. They wanted, if they were sports figures, or even if they were politicians, they wanted to make them bigger than life, because that, that was readership, you know? And, and that was really a trend in, in journalism. It became yellow journalism, of course, when Mr. Hurst got his hands on it. But, but it was really, the standards of storytelling were not nearly as refined as they became after the Second World War. And so what I found really interesting, and I saw this parallel, and he was an observer. He loved sitting in bars. He loved watching people in hotel lobbies. He loved listening to their cats and catching snippets of their, and he drew, just like we do as journalists, he drew assumptions from the way they look, the way they talk, the fatuousness of their dress, the things that the social, you know, the social uh, uh, um, niceties or the social, the social uh, faux pas of, of, of the public. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the observation that showed in his caricatures, right. he can see people in couple of other things. Um, he, uh, you know, had a way with words. And that was probably a combination of a, just the talent he had. But also at his aunt's school, he was a veteran reader. I mean, he later said, I read more from the age of 13 to 18 than the whole rest of, of my life. And Ruby out of Omer Khayyam and Dickens and all the things that people read uh, in, in the late um, in the late 1800s. But yeah, you know, speaking of journalism, um, both at Rolling Stone and then later he was hired by the Houston Post mm -hmm. as a reporter slash columnist where he gave a name for himself, the Postman. And that would be his, his persona as he appeared in these pieces. Um, th this one that I included in the anthology, um, it's called When the Train Comes In. When the train comes in, outline sketches of the Grand Central Depot. So he went to the Houston Railroad Terminal and just sat himself down there for a day and wrote what journalists now would call a scene piece. Mm -hmm. And you know, true, the standards of journalism weren't the same then and hadn't been kind of uh, uh, you know ritualized in those schools. But but this piece, and I taught journalism for years and years. This piece was great. This piece could be in the Washington right. Post style section. Uh, his observation, uh, his precise language, his sense of pacing. He just, he had a talent and a knack. And finally he found, some, he found something that he was actually good at. Of course, then he was at the jail for three years. So right. that put a little crimp in his plans. You know, I've always believed the people who achieve great things, at least in the writings that in the people I've interviewed over almost a 50 year career, they find that thing in them that they can't not do, right? And and he strikes me as the perfect example of somebody who just just that's the only thing he wanted to do was tell stories. It, it, um, it's true, um, but you know, 
it wasn't easy. It, it no, didn't it come easy. Right. If you look at any collection of his letters to, to editors, and again, this um, wonderful museum has some of that, um, the, it's just the same note over and over again. I'll have the story by tomorrow, but I need $25 advance. If you send a messenger, I'll have it there from. I haven't been able to finish it. I've got writers, he didn't use the phrase writer's block, but um, it, reading those, it's almost like a contradictory story that he produced so much. And you know, Ben, but and you know, to do it. You know as well, that is the ultimate cry of every freelance writer in the world. Not like this guy, though. <laughs> I mean, he, he was uh, he was up against it, and um, well, and, and that's why you know there was a great debate. I remember we entered into with the, the museum, the Austin people about mm -hmm. Henry. There was a big movement to prove that he hadn't really embezzled the money, and right. he was sent up the river incorrectly. Uh, I mean, it is sort of a fa it is almost reads like a movie. You know, he he uh, he he's going to the court, and he decides to catch a different train and goes to Honduras instead. Right, he, he, <laughs> yeah. which was the only so, country that didn't have extradition yeah, treaty yeah. with the U.S. and kind yeah. of left his wife holding the bag and, and was there. But for she a was year. supposed to meet him, right? She was, that she was, was the really, plan. Yeah, yeah. supposedly. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, so he and I think uh, you know Gerald Langford and Elias O. Henry pretty much convinced them, and me uh, made the case that he, he was guilty. There's still some mystery and doubt because, for to me and other observers, at his trial he didn't say anything. That's right. He didn't mount a defense. Right. So was he protecting somebody else? Um, I, I, I don't know, but it adds to the, the intriguing mystery yeah, of his life. Intrigue around him. I love the fact that in his what six months in Honduras, he lived with the famous uh, bank robber, or train robber. Well, <laughs> it's is Al Jennings, who, who hooked writer. up with him later in prison um, yeah. and wrote a quite fan, talk about no standards of truth yeah, and accuracy. Yeah, yeah. Al Jennings' book, Through the Shadows with O. Henry, is. Um, uh, certainly as much fiction as fact and claim that he was there. I'm, I'm not sure that Jennings really- but Doesn't that, that tell you exactly what American culture is about? If, if you can invent a story and reinvent yourself, especially in you know, Henry's case, because we know what happened, he's convicted, he's sent to in five years in Ohio. Um, Serve three. I remember, I remember reading that he never, and I don't know if this is true or not, that he, because he ran the nighttime pharmacy or something, right. and he never actually, Served in a cell the whole time, right? Yeah, I don't know about never, but pre pretty quickly on, yeah. he was, you know, he had been trained as a yeah. pharmacist here and was given that job. Yeah. And he wrote letters that he said, I've got the best position um, that there is. Uh, it gave, he was on for 12 hours and almost served as the, the physician right. in, 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 in the nighttime, uh, but left him long hours to write. And he, uh, in the, in the three plus years he was in prison, he sold 14 short stories. I love that. Mm -hmm. And he didn't mail them from prison because yeah. from then on, that was the great secret that he couldn't let on to anybody. Uh, one of you know many secrets in his life. So he had uh, a friend who had been released from prison and was living in New Orleans. So he'd send the stories to New Orleans guy in New Orleans was sent to the editors in New York, and um, uh, he had such success that one of the editors said, you know, um, you, sh you should come live in New York. That's where it's all happening. That's where all the magazines are. And after spending a few months in Pittsburgh, which he hated more than any place he ever was in in his life, um, uh, he, ca he came to New York. And I don't know if he reinvented himself, re reinvented himself, but um, uh, yeah, the rest was history. He was just a fabulous success, but he would never talk about his past. And you know, you see that you see that trope all through American literature. Uh, it's Gatsby, you know, it's Gerald's Gatsby. It's, it's this, and you see it today. And and stars that become stars, and they don't really have that much talent, but they're promoted, and they they follow a, an image to fame and glory. And then it collapses beneath them. You see it again. I, what I'm saying is, I, I think that's such an American trope. 
and 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 absolutely he, reinvention, what, yeah. And the, in terms of his style, when I when I first read it, now I'm a son of the newspaper. My dad was a newspaper guy. He had uh, I'm in Miss, newspaper in Mississippi when I was little, and he worked at the Dallas paper and the Washington Post when I was born. Um, he he used to talk about the early sports writers again. When I'm talking about the Ballyhoo type, yeah. he you, he writes like to my mind like a sports writer from the 1920s. They also embellish their writing with words they maybe didn't understand. You know the proper pronunciator. You know, or, you know <laughs> well, just, you know what I, I might I might beg to differ because I think he. Uh, he had no, he understood him. He understood. Oh, yeah. him. I'm saying, but that was a trait, and I suspect he influenced a generation of Damon Runyons who misused words. He was had wonderful slogans for us. He had and, beautiful right. phrases, and he had characters who just were yeah. the malapropisms of all time exactly. and brilliantly done. But you know, he had um, several identifiable registers in which he wrote, mm -hmm. and. The story that I hope we'll have time to read is an example of a, a real clean journalistic style. Mm -hmm. He had various levels of satirical humor style. He had the uh, almost Dickensian sentimental style that you see. So, um, he, and you would know because you've read 350 of his stories, right? <laughs> I sure do. Yeah. yeah. How about this is a good moment? Why don't you read that story? Okay, sure, I will. Show us, give us an example you know, of that. And I, I'll just say um, the book, the anthology. I, I structured it um, according to where the settings of his stories were, and sort of following his life. Um, and there are the stories set in Texas, stories set in Central America, and by the way, O. Henry coined the phrase Banana Republic. He invented that. Um, uh, he had a, a wonderful book about con artists and graft called The Gentle Grafter and his New York stories, which are the most famous, even though it came to late in life. Not a single story identifiably said in North Carolina. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Well, he was the past. If you, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He right, if he was the past. So th this is one of the Western stories, and it's called Hearts and Hands. And it was one of the first ones he published. It might have been written in, in prison or shortly thereafter. I think it was published in 1902. He got out of prison in 1901. At Denver, there was an influx of passengers into the coaches on the eastbound b &M Express. In one coach, there sat a very pretty young woman dressed in elegant taste and surrounded by all the luxurious comforts of an experienced traveler. Among the newcomers were two young men, one of handsome presence with a bold, frank countenance and manner, the other a ruffled, glum-faced person, heavily built and roughly dressed. The two were handcuffed together. As they passed down the aisle of the coach, the only vacancy it offered was a reversed one facing the young woman. Here, the linked couple seated themselves. The woman's glance fell upon them with a distant, swift disinterest. Then, with a lovely smile brightening her countenance and a tender pink tinging her rounded cheeks, she held out a little gray gloved hand. When she spoke, her voice, full, sweet, and deliberate, proclaimed that its owner was accustomed to speak and to be heard. Well, Mr. Easton, if you will make me speak first, I suppose I must. Don't you ever recognize old friends when you meet them in the West? The younger man roused himself sharply at the sound of her voice. It seemed to struggle with a slight embarrassment, which he threw off instantly, then clasped her fingers with his left hand. It's Miss Fairchild, he said with a smile. I'll ask you to excuse the other hand. It's otherwise engaged at the present. <laughs> he slightly raised his right hand, bound at the wrist by the shining bracelet to the left one of his companion. The glad look in the girl's eyes slowly changed to a bewildered horror. The glow faded from her cheeks. Her lips parted in a vague, relaxing distress. Easton, with a little laugh as if amused, was about to speak again when the other man forestalled him. The glum-faced man had been watching the girl's countenance with veiled glances from his keen, shrewd eyes. Uh, you'll excuse me for speaking this, but I see you're acquainted with the marshal here. 
If you'll ask him to speak a word for me when we get to the pen, he'll do it. And it'll make things easier for me there. He's taking me to Leavenworth prison. It's seven years for counterfeit. Oh, said the girl with a deep breath and returning color. So that's what you're doing out here. A marshal? My dear Miss Fairchild, said Easton calmly, I had to do something. Money has a way of taking wings into itself. And you know it takes money to keep step with our crowd in Washington. I saw this opening in the West and, well, a marshalship isn't quite as high as a position as that of an ambassador, but the ambassador, the girl said warmly, doesn't call anymore. He didn't ever have done so. You ought to know that. And so now you're one of those dashing Western heroes and you ride and shoot and go into all sorts of dangers. That's different from the Washington life. You've been missed from the old crowd. The girl's eyes, fascinated, went back, widening a little, to rest upon the glittering handcuffs. Don't you worry about them, miss, said the other man. All marshals handcuff themselves to their prisoners to keep them from getting away. Mr. Easton knows his business. Will we see you again in Washington, asked the girl. Um, not soon, I think, said Easton. My butterfly days are over, I fear. I love the West, said the girl irrelevantly. Her eyes were shining softly. She looked out, away out the car window. She began to speak truly and simply without the gloss of style and manner. Mama and I spent the summer in Denver. She went home a week ago because father was slightly ill. I could live and be happy in the West. I think the air here agrees with me. Money isn't everything, but people may always misunderstand things and remain stupid. Say, Mr. Marshall, growled the glum-faced man. This isn't quite fair. I'm needing a drink, and I haven't had a smoke all day. Haven't you talked long enough? Take me in the smoker now, won't you? I'm half dead for a pipe. The bound travelers rose to their feet, Easton with the same slow smile on his face. I can't deny a petition for tobacco, he said lightly, is the one friend of the unfortunate. Goodbye, Miss Fairchild. Duty calls, you know. He held out his hand for a farewell. It's too bad you're not going east, she said, but clothing herself with manner and style. But you must go on to Leavenworth, I suppose. Yes, said Easton, I must go to Leavenworth. The two men sidled down the aisle into the smoker. Two passengers in a seat nearby had heard most of the conversation, said one of them. That marshal's a good sort of chap. Some of these Western fellows are all right. Pretty young to hold an office like that, isn't he? Asked the other. Young, exclaimed the first speaker. Why, uh, didn't you catch on? Say, did you ever know an officer to handcuff a prisoner to his right hand? That's the man of the West. I'm, I'm gonna, I'd like to do a very short section on, on the man of the East in New York. Uh, I'll set it up this way first. Uh, when I was about 10 years old, was when my dad gave me the collective works of the Henry. And he was a big, as I said, to start out, he was a huge of Henry. Fan. One of the things he liked was he spoke to the common man. He told stories and he had no problem, and the critics hated him. I mean, they just savaged his writing, I think. And they, they, they probably resented him because he was so successful. I always heard he was the most famous writer in the world, 19... Oh, three to four. Is that true? Uh, you know, how, how can and you decide? He was up there. Yeah. yeah. His high, uh, high point was sort of 1906, yeah. his death in 1910, and, and in the early teens, by the late teens and the 20s, things had passed him by, and Hemingway was around yeah. in a whole new. But they probably, they all read him, I'm sure. And uh, so, in, I, so, so, in 1963 or four, my dad decided it's time to take his two. Uh, provincial sons and his wife to New York to see the big city. So we flew up to see the the, the show at, uh, at, at at the music center, at the music hall, Radio and, City. Yeah, and we did all the tour sites. And uh, my dad was an old hand. He had been to New York many, many times. He's now was an advertising and newspaper, so he he was very familiar. But one morning we were staying at the Vanderbilt Hotel, 
He, t- he nudged me awake and he said, come on, we're going to go get down, way downtown and get bagels. And so <laughs> we got on a, a subway and we clattered downtown. It's freezing cold. It's right around Christmas time. It's really, really cold. And we get out and we go to this bagel shop. He knew where this deli he knew about. And we get warm bagels and we're coming back and we walk a different way. And he walks, but we walk by a park where there's grapes on the sidewalk and there are men homeless men lying on those grapes and and they have newspapers over their legs i've never seen he he didn't stop and stare he said i want you to watch look closely as we go by don't don't embarrass this person the guy was just and i had i I couldn't believe it i I saw the guy one guy's leg would look blue made a huge impact on a 10 year old from greensboro north carolina who could ride his bike all over town in the safest town in the south um and I remember, again, you know, that, that's time he gave me the human stories. And, and uh, so years later, um, uh, and it was even before I became the editor, I had a favorite, my favorite story is, is, a, is a wonderful story called The Cop and the Anthem. Um, ben mentioned it earlier, it's one of his. Uh, what I love about this story is um, it could be today. And, and it's every relevant to today as it was in his day. Uh, and it also speaks to, to his decency, and it, and it has the wonderful O. Henry ending, which is why our O. Henry magazine has an O. Henry ending in every one of its issues. I'll set the story up briefly. Soapy is a homeless man uh, who lives somewhere around Madison Park, and he uh, he uh, the winters are really really getting harder for him. He uh, has always been able to engineer a way into getting to the island, which I guess is the prison or the, mm-hmm. the jail. Yeah. Uh, that's be a warm night. So he, he's really miserable, very cold, it's very windy. He decides he's got to get himself arrested. So the first thing he does is he, he's got a fairly presentable tie and coat, but his pants are ragged. He goes across to this very famous restaurant, goes in, assuming he can just sit down, he's going to order a sumptuous meal. He'll uh, have wine, a good wine. He'll have a, an after dinner drink. Uh, he'll have a lush dessert. And he'll have a cigar. And he won't have any money to pay for it, and the owner, the major D, will have him arrested. Uh, instead, he doesn't get that far. He's tossed out. Um, he's bewildered that he can't get arrested that way. So he, he's a few doors later, he, a few doors down the block, he sees this. this there's a store with a big plate glass window. He picks up a stone, throws it through the window, breaks the window. People are horrified. People start running to the to the scene. He stands there waiting for the police to show up. The policeman comes up. And he says, well, to the effect of, you know, uh, well, how about that? You know, I broke the window. And the cop says, no, you couldn't have done it. You would be running away. Why would you break the window and stand here and be arrested? <laughs> so this guy can't get arrested for anything. Uh, it goes on and on. He ends up, uh, at one point, he, he, uh, he accosts a, a, a lady, a good-looking lady who's well-dressed and uh, in beautiful uh, form. Uh, and he decides that he goes up and becomes a masher. And there's a cop standing right next to her that that will get him arrested. So he goes up and he says some provocative things to her. The cop hears him, keeping a sharp eye on him. The woman turns to him and says, actually, I like you a lot. In fact, let's go off together and have some fun. <laughs> well, poor guy. Uh, he wanders away disconsolately. He goes around the block. Uh, there's a, the, the opera's letting out. Uh, he decides he's going to scream and yell and present himself as a madman for all these wealthy people who were coming out into the winter night. And uh, there's a cop there and the cop says to the people, you know, this, we have to feel really sorry for the guy, just ignore him. He's, you know, he's a kind soul. He's just lost his mind and people understand and they don't, the cop doesn't arrest him. He steals, attempts to steal somebody's umbrella. Uh, and the poor man says, actually, it might be your umbrella after all. I, I took, it, took it illegally someplace else. So the poor guy just cannot get arrested and therefore into a warm jail cell. So in desperation, uh, so after the, the umbrella man gets me back, uh, lets me take the, uh, this is the brief ending that I think is a, well, maybe the most, my mind, the most touching ending besides the gift of the Magi. So we walked eastward through a street damaged by improvements. He hurled the umbrella wrathfully into an excavation. He muttered against the man who, uh, who the, 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 sorry, the men who wear helmets and carry clubs because he wanted to fall into their clutches. They seemed to regard him as a king who could do no wrong. At length, Sophie, Sophie reached one of the avenues of the east where the glitter and turmoil was but faint. 
He set his face down toward Madison Square, where the homing instinct survives even when the home is a park bench. But on an unusually quiet corner, Sophie came to a standstill. Here was an old church, quaint and rambling and gay. Um, through one violet stained window, a soft light glowed, where, no doubt, the organist loitered over the keys, making sure of his mastery of the coming Sabbath anthem. But there drifted out to Sophie's ears sweet music that caught and held him transfixed against the convolutions of the iron fence. The moon was above, lustrous and serene. Vehicles and pet pedestrians were few. Sparrows twittered sleepily in the eaves. For it was a little while the sea might have been for, for a little while the sea might have been a country churchyard. And the anthem that the organist played uh, cemented Sophie to the iron fence. For he had known it well in his days for his life uh, when his life contained such things as mothers and roses and ambitions and friends and immaculate thoughts and collars. The conjunction of Sophie's receptive state of mind and the influence about the old church brought a sudden and wonderful change in his soul. He viewed with swift horror the pit into which he had tumbled. This book's ancient, so forgive the slow. The degraded days, the unworthy desires, dead hopes, wrecked facilities, and base motives that made up his existence. And also in that moment, his heart responded thrillingly to this novel mood. An instantaneous and strong impulse moved him to battle with his desperate fate. He would pull himself out of the mire. He would make a man of himself again. He would conquer the evil that had taken possession of him. There was time. He was comparatively young yet. He would resurrect his old eager ambitions and pursue them without faltering. Those solemn but sweet organ notes had set up a revolution in him. Tomorrow, he would go into the roaring downtown district and find work. A fur importer had once offered him a place as a driver. He would find him tomorrow and ask for that position. He would, he, he would be somebody in the world. He would, Sophie felt a hand laid on his arm. He looked quickly around into the broad face of a policeman. What are you doing here? Asked the officer. Nothing, said Sophie. Then come along, said the policeman. Three months on the island, said the magistrate in the police court the next morning. <laughs> I remember my dad told me that there was a movie, uh, and I didn't remember because it, it came out the year I was born, 1953, I think, uh, of five. Oh, Henry Fulhouse, uh, yeah, five stories. And um, Charles Lawton played the bum, and the hooker was played by a new film star named Marilyn Monroe, um, which made me want to watch it more than ever. Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I just think his, this is a man whose spirit lives in the still. And I, I'm so glad that this is out. And I hope it's, I know it's getting a, I just wrote, wrote, read a wonderful review in the, in the Wall Street Journal of um, Ben's book. And it's just, to me, it's just wonderful to see this circulating through. And you've been doing that for 45 minutes. Why don't we we'll try open it up and see if behind your mask, you have questions, your lips are moving, you have, want to ask us a question. Do you want to do the uh, call? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll go ahead. Yeah. Oh, stand up. You can stand and up. Shout. <laughs> and shout. I, I can talk loudly. Okay, okay. Uh, my favorite story is Ransom of Red Sheep. I think that right. is a lot yeah, of people. Second. It's also been filmed. It was yeah. in that anthology yeah. you mentioned. Go to IMDb and find it. But there was a hallmark, one of those usually horrible hallmark yeah. films of Ransom hmm. a few years back, and the kidnappers were played very well by Christopher Lloyd and Michael Jeter. Oh my God. And so I commend <laughs> that, that to you all. Yeah. Uh, I also would like to, if just a second, we, uh, place him in some context that fits some local writers. Uh, Johnson Jones Hooper, who was from Wilmington, and Hardin Toller, who was from nearby Surrey County, were what were called Southwestern humorists, kind of in league with later Mark Twain. Uh, Hooper said famously, it was good to be shifty in a young country. <laughs> and I, I found the kidnappers also, much like the Duke and the Dolphin, 
in Twain's, uh, Twain's work. Uh, so I, I think I think there is, even though he didn't set the stories in North Carolina, much of that yep. storytelling. Grifters, Grifters, his life and his stories is played out most clearly with the uh, the uh, theme of Grifters. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the Southwest humorist because. Uh, Rasmus Redchief rightly is in virtually every, if not every, anthology of American humor. And um, uh, th these characters, these grifters, prospectors, um, you know, bums, uh, he, he had a great ear for them and an eye for them. And 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 some of the, the stories of priceless. The, the general grafter, that uh, series of um, uh, of stories about this con artist named Jeff Peters is is great and it's unheard of. You know, uh, I had never heard of it when I started looking into it, but um, I, I think his strongest his strongest uh, stuff is his humorous stuff. And there's compassion in that humor. I mean, consider Sophie. I mean, he, he seemed. You know, I mean, I just think that's no question. Yeah, know, no, I, I'm, I'm glad you pointed across, that out. Yeah. You know. Any other questions? Oh, I saw the hand. Maybe you're adjusting your mask. We do have one question from the computer sure. uh, for, from, from YouTube, so I'm excited to read that. Uh, from Joseph McGuire, who wants to inquire, didn't know Henry lived, we oh, uh, it's about Asheville, okay. Didn't know Henry live Weaverville, write one story and have an office in the Sondley building in Asheville. It might be an Asheville spy coming in. Yeah, do we, I, do we know this, or can we confirm or unconfirm? I can't. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so prejudiced the other way. I just can't be yeah. considered a I, I, I don't know. I, you know, he, he, he uh, married his second wife, um, Sarah Coleman, whom he had known as a, as a kid, um, and in 1907 when he only had uh, three years to live, and she was in Asheville. He spent some time with her there. Um, I don't know about an office. Was that, uh, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think but so. I, what I always found tough about that, she did, she divorced him and then, you know, and then he died a year later. I, yep. That's new to me as well. Yeah, I, she did. She divorced him and he died a year later. And she hauled his, yeah, they had the funeral service in New York. And then she, I guess she must have paid for it. And they, they sent him by train to, to Asheville. Went right to Greensboro. Probably. Still bitter. I, I, you know, I didn't know him, man, but I won his story, so I, I won his uh, award. So I, I have to advocate for Greensboro. You know? Yeah, I was speaking about Henry Ward's, I'll just say a little bit about um, a little bit more about his reputation. So um, he he was hailed uh, in the American Maupassant, you know, in yeah. uh, yeah. Guy de Maupassant who kind of was the original pioneer of the twist ending, the French uh, writer, um, and, and was kind of, you know, I don't know about the most famous American writer, but he was at the top of um, the short story writing genre in, in the, the, the last decade, the first, the last half of the first decade of the, of the 20th century. At a time when, when the short story was, I would argue, the, the prime American mode of, of entertainment. I mean, it was before movies, before TV, before radio. Um, theater was a special occasion. Vaudeville went around the country, but again, it was special. A short stories was like the TV of today in that there were these uh, uh, pieces that you could read in a, in a sitting of an evening. And it was it was the thing that, that quickly changed. But... Um, in the teens, he still had a reputation. It, it pretty much went the other way by the time the 20s came around and Hemingway and modernism um, came to the fore. But, you know, you won the O. Henry Prize. Respectfully, the more famous O. Henry Prize is still given to the best American short story of the year. And we don't let him compete in Greensboro. <laughs> <laughs> by, by Doubleday. And Doubleday was his publisher, so it was a kind of crafty move on their part. I think it started in 1919. So um, every, every year, they put out a volume of the best short stories called the O. Henry Awards. And 
that has probably been the thing that has kept his name uh, alive the most when ironically his critical stature is, uh, is pretty low. I mean, I, I taught in an English department and I would bet, you know, um, everything I have on me that in my 25 years, the University of Delaware English Department, not a single piece of O. Henry was taught. Um, I don't think my book will, by anthology um, will change that, but um, <laughs> maybe it'll, you know, and already, you know, the, 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 the piece of the Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker had a piece. Um, I, th I think, and I hope that he's entering into the, at least the conversation. Of American well, I'll tell you as an old political writer, uh, one of the, and just you just traveled the wagon road, which is the road all the Scots, Irish, Germans, Lutherans, Moravians, Scot uh, uh, Quakers took to, to the South. One of the things that really surprised me, and it doesn't when you stop and look at the, what the politics of today, is that Americans crave authenticity and they're retreating quickly into the past to find meaning. You see it in the explosion of Ancestry.com and all of these at mm -hmm. 23 and Me. People want to find are finding comfort in these old stories. I understand children's books of 150, 75 years ago are booming. My friends in the book world are telling me this. But I, my, uh, right now, the hottest genre going is biography and memoir. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because people crave real stories. And we cannot read O. Henry without realizing this guy based these vignettes, these stories, these these little um, uh, um, glimpses of the passing parade on real life. And I think that's what's extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, is there any other questions? OK, you're all Rihanna. Oh, wait, we have a uh, uh, question in the back. Yeah. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that you have gone to jail for investment. From whom was he investment? OK, so he was a bank teller. Uh, at the First National Bank in Austin, Texas. And uh, the initial accusations were of a higher amount of money than he eventually stood trial and was convicted on. I believe the, the trial was, there were two deposits that were made to him as a teller, which he pocketed and never registered in the bank. So it was um, taking the money of depositors in the bank. You know, it was pretty clear that he, he didn't abscond with it, that he intended to repay it. And, you know, everybody who writes about banking uh, customs of the time said things were fast and loose, the uh, behavior that wouldn't be tolerated later was tolerated. So. The, the best guess is that he had, I mentioned he had started this magazine and that's an expensive proposition. It wasn't uh, rolling in great success that he took the money to temporarily pay some of the bills in the magazine and intended to repay it with the great profits the magazine would, would generate. But time caught up to him. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um... I was curious about his experience with travel and other cultures because, um, I, I like you, I hadn't really um, read much of Henry since uh, junior high, high school. But in knowing I was going to attend this event, I, I read a few of his stories. And one, I, I'm not sure I can pronounce the uh, the word he invented: Cosmo Light and the Cafe. I don't know if you remember that one, but. Um, he it reflected such a knowledge of different cultures in the world like he had references to afghan culture and i thought wow in his short life he must have traveled a bit or well you way. know um he he was a fast learner i'll yeah. say that his his traveling uh the foreign travel was limited to his six months to a year in honduras mm -hmm. and he got a book out of that um, which was, again, a, a very, uh, the gender grafter and this other one, Cabbages and Kings, are linked short stories, a kind of sophisticated structure about a country, a banana republic based on Honduras. Um, the other stuff, you know, um, Yogi Berra 
once said, supposedly, you can observe a lot by just watching. <laughs> and, and he watched, you know, Jim was saying he, he was an observer. He, he read, he read the That's newspapers. The um, you know, he, he had just this absorbed. Arabian Nights. Um, he was always talking about caliphs of Baghdad. And a, a lot of it was, he was a little bit like one of his characters who, in, in his writing, not in his personality, um, uh, who, who was a little blustery and, and uh, grandiloquent. But yeah, his, um, he, you know, he was, he was in Texas, he was in prison, he was in North Carolina, he was in Pittsburgh briefly, and he was in New York. That, that was kind of it. Um, when you're a reader, you can voice the world. And like Baudelaire said, save your violence for your writing, your fiction. That's exactly what he did. I mean, he was from his early days here in Greensboro when he, when he pillaged out libraries and read one of the reasons I always heard he got in trouble with his uncle was because he was, he was reading books instead of tending business at the, at the, at the pharmacy. Um, you know, how many people, you know, Dixon traveled the world in her, in her, in her books and, and never yeah, she said there is no frigate like a book. Exactly. Like so, you know, um, I think he is a, per, again, a guy, I come back to that American, this, this big world that America was this boiling new, what was your wonderful quote there about, you know, a, a, a young country deserves chicanery. I forget the exact quote you gave, but. but uh, it is good to be shifty in a young country. Yeah, sure. perfect. I think that's, the, we can leave it there. But, oh. you know, I just think that's just great. I, I think he was a reader. Yes, sir. Um, in your footnotes, you make reference to um, uh -oh. University of Virginia, Charlottesville collection. Can you speak about what they have? And yeah. Um, so in this book, the, the sort of uh, the news lead of the book is that there's three stories here never published before in any form, magazine or book, and they're from the collection of the University of Virginia. And I, the short answer is I don't know how they got there. Um, in their manuscript and archives collection, they have a kind of grab bag of stuff. They have a fascinating inter-office memo from Doubleday um, listing every story he wrote and where it was published first and what book it ended up in. Um, and they've got letters, they've got radio scripts of radio plays based on O. Henry stories. And they've got these um, 12 or 15 manuscripts, some of which uh, are stories that were later published, but a uh, half dozen of which, of which I chose three, were not. And one of them is a typescript and um, it's got, he's penciled his return address in Austin, you know, Fifth Street, Austin, Texas, called The Return of Old Angles. And it's just sitting there. Um, and I don't know, the sense is that Doubleday somehow got it, but um, I don't know how. Uh, it's a mystery. I don't know where. And is there it's anything else that you looked at that you'll say, hey, maybe some publisher ought to do a, a lengthy magazine feature on and go back to Charlottesville and publish some other things? You no, know, I picked I pick the best. <laughs> I got the cream of the crop in there. Um, you know, for uh, anyone who's, uh, you know, O. Henry obsessive or a huge fan has got some time in their hands, uh, that, that's a good collection to go to because they also have the papers of Alfonso Smith, who oh, yeah. was a biographer, bi yeah. but also and was from here, I believe, <laughs> and, and, and knew him. So all his papers and uh, be, Al Alfonso Smith was the first biography and was a kind of whitewash and gave this idea that he really wasn't guilty. And my, my friend, my hero, Gerald Langford, who wrote Elias O. Henry, I mean, I don't know the man, he's, he's, he's I'm sure long gone. He went to the Alfonso Smith papers and found letters written to Alfonso Smith in his research that shed not so positive a light uh, on O. Henry and used them in his book. But they're all there at University of Virginia as well. So the three places where there are big collections of O. Henry are right here. Um, and, you know, wonderfully, so much of the stuff here from Greensboro is online and, and digitized. Um, Virginia and, and Texas, the old Henry uh, Museum in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm.
This might Thanks be a good place to, to end. And uh, thank you all for coming out. And let's do it for Ben and his fabulous people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, look forward to seeing you back here at the museum soon. If you don't subscribe to our e news and stuff like that, go to our website, greensboroughhistory.org. Get on our lists, follow our social media, and find out other great stuff that is going to be happening throughout the year. Ben's going to be signing some books out there for a little bit. So, thank you again for coming. Yeah. <laughs>